had a session on the introduction of uh, qualitative research and the methodologies uh, that we uh, use in qualitative research. Uh, today's session is uh, focused on qualitative data analysis. So we discussed that there are uh, different uh, data collection methods such as interviews and focus group discussions, and we can also have documentary analysis of uh, documents. And there are different methodologies such as uh, ethnography, phenomenology, grounded theory, uh, narrative research. Uh, so today we are uh, going to focus on the qualitative data analysis. So I'll immediately start with the session so that we can uh, save a bit of your time. Um, so let me share the slides. Okay, so I hope you all can uh, see the slides now. And uh, the plan is the same. We'll have a presentation around the first 40 minutes or so. Uh, and we can also have questions in between the session, or we can also have questions towards the end. And in the last 10 minutes, uh, we will have a, a, a small MCQ test um, regarding this session and overall the qualitative research. Okay, so I have, I'll start with this picture. And the reason for starting with this picture is because probably in some, at some point in our lives, uh, when we were in our undergrads or in postgrads, we did something similar to uh, our books, the way uh, it is done to this book. So we used to highlight the important data that was there in the books. We would uh, put on the sticky notes. We would also write our own interpretation or understanding uh, about the topic. And uh, for example, acute inflammation. So we would in Robin's pathology. So we would be highlighting it and we would be try putting on the sticky notes and we would read it again and again. And the students who would uh, top in our classes uh, their data analysis, or they would have read the book uh, more than us. So probably if I would be reading this book for maybe two or three times for my final year exams, uh, probably the one who would be uh, getting uh, extremely good marks, more than 80% marks, they would be reading the same book maybe seven or eight times. So this is uh, qualitative data analysis. So this is something that we have been doing, qualitative data analysis, and that's why I always tell my colleagues that this is not something that I have to teach because uh, qualitative data analysis is something that we have been doing throughout our lives. Uh, so today we are just going to uh, probably discuss the methodology or the structure of uh, a methodological structure of how we do a qualitative data analysis. Uh, and as I said, we have been doing it. We used to have our own methods, maybe in first instance, we would just underline and use a pencil. In the second instance, we would use a highlighter. In the third instance, I would be using maybe a green highlighter. And in the fourth instance, I would be then using the uh, red highlighter to further uh, focus on the important concepts. And then probably we would also write our sticky notes and notes. So this was the methodology that we used to use. So we are going to discuss this very same methodology uh, that we used to have. Okay, so what are the steps in qualitative data collection and analysis? So we start with planning of interviews and focus group discussions with our target uh, participants. Uh, then we would be recording initially before the time of audios and mobile phones, uh, the practice was just to write down the notes and to develop their shorthand practice. However, nowadays because of the uh, technology, we can simply just put the mobile phone on airplane mode so that no call can disturb us and then we can simply uh, use the audio recorder or we, in case if video recording is also required, so we can also have video recording. And memo is our own note. So while we are collecting the data, we also observe the participants and we write down our own notes. So they are also part of our data analysis and they are called memos. And after that, then we would be transcribing, we will be typing it in the MS Word document or if you are using any software, so we would transcribe and nowadays uh, that uh, technology again has advanced, so we would be typing it all by ourselves. However, now you can use 
different software. So just like Otter AI, that can just do the task for you. So we would be spending maybe uh, 10 to 12 bars on type one interview, whereas now Otter AI can simply uh, transcribe up to 15 interviews in just less than a few hours time. So after that comes the qualitative data analysis. And again, you can do it using uh, manual analysis, just using uh, printing it out and again, going to the old methods of highlighting and putting on the sticky notes, or you can use a software as well that if we have time, so we probably have, uh, maybe we not have time. So, but you can also use software in case if we get some time towards the end, then I can probably show you uh, software that we uh, use for qualitative data analysis. Okay, so uh, just as we know that in quantitative research, we have different analysis uh, techniques. Similarly, in qualitative research, we also have different analysis techniques. So one is content analysis. Uh, another one is thematic analysis. That is the most common one uh, that is used. Then comes the framework analysis. If you are using a theoretical framework, usually we do not use theoretical frameworks if you are doing a um, pharma industry research or if we are doing research in public health or in surgery. However, we do uh, use theories and theoretical frameworks if you are more into education or social sciences or anthropology perspectives. Uh, we also have uh, storytelling. So for narrative research, we also have narrative analysis that is slightly different than the thematic analysis. And then uh, we can also have phenomenological analysis, which is more or less same as thematic analysis. However, because of the purpose of phenomenology, which is to focus on a phenomena, so these analyses may be looking at a different aspects from the same data. And then comes the discourse analysis. So as you know, discourse is uh, the way we use language. So how we use language with patients, how a doctor uses language with his colleagues, uh, how a doctor uh, uses uh, language in academic writings. So this is, if we are doing, and if we are trying to look into the linguistics of how we use the language in that situation, then we can use discourse analysis. So that is sort of a combination of, thema and rather I usually tell my colleagues that uh, a discourse analysis is something like doing a thematic analysis three times. So that's about the depth of discourse analysis. So just to go through it, and this is just, uh, as you know, this is just awareness session. You can uh, then go and read the details, or if we can have more sessions, we can discuss the details of each of the analysis technique later on. Just to give you an idea, this is uh, a tag crowd, and uh, this is just telling us about the words. Uh, of a content of a script. So you can see there are different free even uh, websites such as Word Cloud in which you can put in all your transcript or you can just upload it. Even the MS Word can also do it for you. And you can see which words are used most commonly in the script or in the interview. And this shows the focus. So I was just analyzing the uh, definitions of professionalism by different individuals and organizations such as Journal Medical Council or Pakistan Medical and Dental Council or uh, uh, NHS uh, so, uh, or Australian Medical Council. So I was looking into it and I was doing content analysis and this is what I found that the focus was, uh, organization's focus was mostly on patients or this is what it seems. However, uh, this does not give us a complete picture or the context of how these words, words were used. For example, if I give you, uh, if I can maybe highlight a word such as communication, maybe it's somewhere, uh, or skill, sorry, not communication. So the word skills, yeah, here it is. So this is the word skill. So here you can see it gave me an impression as if, because when it comes to skills, we the things that immediately comes to our mind is maybe some procedural skills, passing an isogastric tube or passing a Foley's catheter. However, when I looked into the context and when I read through it, I realized it was the word was actually communication skills. And uh, the software actually broke these two words from and separated them 
and analyzed it differently. So this is then the limitation of the content analysis. Usually content analysis is done quite a lot in journalism. Uh, when uh, the journalists, they are transcribing and they are looking into the content of the speeches of politicians or what is said in the assemblies or in the uh, parliaments. So, and then they can probably tweak the data around and uh, they can just say if they are in the favor or if they are in the against of whatever the argument is. So you can see that content analysis does not give you a very good or complete picture. And there are different ways of it. Probably when I was doing it, I found that there are almost 12 different ways of doing content analysis. So then we move on to domain analysis technique and that is thematic analysis. And I always tell my colleagues that thematic analysis is the basis of all the qualitative research. If you understand thematic analysis, then you can also do framework analysis. You can also do phenomenological analysis or grounded theory analysis or narrative analysis. So this is the basis. Uh, and once you understand it, then you can appreciate the slight differences in the other methods as well. But this is the most commonly used qualitative data analysis technique. Yes, so uh, Dr. Farheen, we are going to discuss thematic analysis and I'll be explaining it. First, I'll give you some examples just to challenge you what sort of a data we receive and how we can analyze that data. Uh, and then we'll slightly go into the complexities and also the area of thematic analysis. It is just like generating themes. And I always give an example of uh, the story of Thirsty Crow. So we all read in our primary schools the story of a thirsty crow uh, who was a crow that was thirsty and then it started putting in stones um, and so that the water level would rise. But what was the moral of the story? The moral of the story, there were different models of the story. Uh, necessity is mother of invention or God help those who help themselves. So these were the uh, models or the themes that came out of that story. And this was quite a generic uh, 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 theme or a moral. Necessity as mother of invention is something that you can apply to many walks of life. For example, uh, we came up with invention of uh, COVID vaccine because COVID came. So necessity came and then the invention came and followed it. So uh, I'll go again, I'll go with these examples and probably it will further clarify. So let's look into this example. Uh, this is maybe a quotation, again, from an interview. I noticed that the grand majority of homes have chain-like fences in front of them. There are many dogs, mostly German shepherds, with signs on fences that say, beware of the dog. So this is called, sorry, this is called descriptive code. And now we are going to come into the uh, definition of codes. But just to give you an example of code, our language is all coding. So whatever words we are using, it's all coded. What is the meaning behind it? And we are always looking for that meaning behind what we are saying. Similarly, we also use the term coding in, in SPSS. So SPSS understands numerical data. It can do the calculations with numerical data. So what we do? We will put men with zero and women with one. So then SPSS can calculate frequencies. Okay, the men had range, age range from this or weight or height from this range or systolic or diastolic blood pressure or different age groups from this. So this is how SPSS code. But SPSS uh, would put the language or the English of the words into numerics. Whereas in qualitative research, we would be using uh, codes, uh, just to summarize what does it mean or what's the meaning coming out of this data. So let's move on to another example. So what is the code that we are looking over here or maybe the third code? He cares about me. He has never told me, but he does. So there is sense of self-worth. He's always been there for me, even when my parents were not. He is one of the few things that I hold as a constant in my life. So it's nice. I really feel comfortable around him. So the second code over here is stability. And the third code here is uh, comfortable is 
let's see this is in vivo so in vivo means anything from within the data so the message that i want to clarify over here is that a code can be your understanding about the content of the interview or focus group that is from outside whereas a code can also be something that is from within the data so you can see the word comfortable is from within the data as the word stability or the broad sense of self were there from outside the data. So this is called in vivo code. And we'll be, as I said, we'll be discussing these different types of codes. Let's look into another example. Okay, so here we uh, see that, uh, let's uh, read through the transcript. Mrs. Jackson rises from her desk and announces, okay, you guys, Let's get lined up for lunch. One, five children seated in the first row of desks rise and walk to the classroom door. Some of the seated children talk to each other. Mrs. Jackson looks at them and says, no talking, save it for the cafeteria. Row two, five children seated in the second row of desks rises, eyes and walk to the children already standing in line. So you can see instruction, there is a researcher who's observing maybe children and maybe interaction between children and their teacher, how maybe a teacher is uh, managing the primary school children. Um, and you can see the instructions that the teacher is giving. So how the uh, researcher is coding the data. So the first code is lining up for lunch. And then in continuation, there is another code that is called managing behavior. So this is also called simultaneous coding. You can just call it open code or these are different varieties of code and they keep on generating these different varieties of coding. 10 years back when, or maybe 12 years back when I was at that time, there were a list of some 32 different types of um, coding. But now I think that has increased. Okay, so let's move on to uh, another example. This one is a bit tricky one. And the reason it is a bit tricky is that which methodology you are using because, and this is again showing the complexity of qualitative research and qualitative data analysis, that a same transcript, if it is looked at from different lens will give us a different meaning. So from grounded theory perspective, what does it mean from ethnography and from critical race theory? There is just no place in this country for illegal immigrants. Round them up and send those criminals back to where they came from. So grounded theory is more focused on in vivo coding. What is the data, so they want to generate a 3D from within the data. So the code over here that is important is in vivo code, that is no place, that is coming from within the data. Ethnography want to describe this phenomenon. So this is a descriptive code such as immigration issues because the focus of ethnography, if you can recall from the previous lecture, it's focused on culture immersion in culture, to explore the culture. Whereas, critical race theory, it's more focused on the value systems of the people. So the value system, and then the code over here will be slightly different, such as xenophobia. Xenophobia is maybe merging of the two cultures or merging of the two nations. And the phobia is the fear. So fear of merging, so we use the term xenophobia in ethics research as well. Uh, when uh, there is a crafting of two species and they want to make so over here two cultures because the immigrants have come into uh, a culture and the people within that culture they are afraid of uh, mixing up so this is showing the value system so you can see the another message that is here is that we uh, focused on three messages one message was that a good can be something that is from outside the data, a group can be something that is from within the data. And the third message is that the code may change 
because of the methodology and the purpose or the objective or the research question that we are using. So let's look into uh, coding from interview transcripts and let's look into this example. So this is maybe again a research question. Uh, compare this ambulatory care rotation. Ambulatory care is any outpatient department, so any OPD. Two other clinical rotations you have, for example, you have added emergency medicine rotation or emergency uh, or casualty rotation uh, in your final year. And you are now asking the students in an interview that how this new rotation has added uh, to your competency as a physician or as a doctor in terms of knowledge or clinical competence or career development. So this is the question that we have asked maybe house officers or maybe final year or fourth year students. And as I said that the students, they are going to give us interviews or focus group, and then we are going to make a transcription. We are going to type it so that we can analyze it. And here you can see uh, two of the transcripts for the same question. The independence allowed me to gain more confidence in my clinical skills. The hurried pace helped me to become more efficient. You can just take a few seconds, read through it, and I'll just uh, take a few sips from water. Okay, so let's now look into what gets coded. So this is the next question that would be coming to your mind. So any major unit of social organization, such as cultural practices, daily routine, occupation, microculture activity, episodes, any irregular activity such as divorce, championship games, any natural disaster, any encounter, a temporary interaction, again, as I emphasize, this will vary and change depending on the methodology and your research question. Temporary interaction between two or more. And the same happens in quantitative research as well. Uh, we do not have sufficient enough time to compare it with the quantitative research. But same happens in quantitative research. With the change in the objective, you can extract different information from the same piece of the data set. Then the rules that we have. So depending on the rules, we can also, have, uh, or the social type, uh, we can also then code the data. Uh, social and personal relationships. So we can use this for coding. Uh, what are the major groups, gangs, congregations, families, organizations, uh, settlements and habitats and sub subcultures and lifestyles. Another important aspect is to analyze these units of social awareness from the following aspects. So cognitive aspects or meaning, for example, ideologies, rules, self-concept identities, emotional aspects or feelings, for example, sympathy in healthcare, road rage, workplace satisfaction, hierarchical aspects or inequalities, racial inequalities, battered women or high school cliques. So this slide would give you, I think, uh, quite a good idea about what gets coded. So what sort of information you are looking into? And I give a very simple example to my colleagues that in Viva, what happens, we are asking students about maybe questions and the student, we are looking for a certain specific answer. If the student gives us that answer, we would give the student five out of five or full marks or 10 out of 10. But if the student does not give us the clear answer, so we would then reduce the marks depending on the decision. For example, if you ask me a question, what is your name? And I start giving you an answer, okay, I am a health professional, I am a medical doctor, uh, I have done my MBBS from Pakistan, I have done my postgraduate qualification from uh, this university. So all this information is correct, but what was your question? Your question was, what is your name? And I have told you everything about myself, except the question that you asked, that was, what is my name? And the simple answer to it was, my name is Usman. Okay, so this is what we are looking for. We are looking for our questions. And the, and the reason for giving you this clarity is because there is so much data in qualitative research, that probably you will just I mean, the flow of the data may take you away from your objective or from your research question. So you, whenever you start getting lost in qualitative data, 
what I always suggest, go back to your research question or maybe write your research question or objective on at the top of every page so that you know what you actually are looking in your data. Because as we saw the same data set, the same data set can be interpreted in different ways depending on your research question and methodology. Okay, so as you said, I gave an example initially that probably a student who would fail in our class in pathology, that student would have also studied the book of, of pathology, maybe Robin's pathology or any other book, uh, but maybe just once or twice, but still that student is going to fail in pathology because his coding or his understanding of pathology was still not sufficient enough. To pass pathology, you have to read it at least three or four times in undergrads. And then to get good marks, probably their depth would be made more to get maybe 70 or 80% marks. Those students would be studying Robin's pathology maybe six or seven times. They would be revising it again and again. So what they are doing, they are trying to look at relationships. For example, just to give you an idea of the second cycle. Now, second cycle does not mean reading it for the second time. Second cycle... May Maybe a student who has a quite a good background of pathology, uh, maybe he has done some bachelor's before coming to uh, a medical program. So that student may reach to the depth of the or the second cycle of pathology, uh, maybe by just reading it second or third time, whereas a uh, you know, student may have to read it six or seven times. So this is to give you an idea about the experience of a qualitative researcher. An experienced qualitative researcher may be able to extract data more efficiently as compared to a novice researcher because of their understanding of the analysis. So just to give you an idea of axial defined relationship, for example, we studied acute inflammation maybe in chapter two or three in pathology, and then we studied about uh, metastasis. Maybe that, I think that was chapter eight or something in Robin's pathology, in journal pathology. And then when we read about acute inflammation, we started, okay, how does the sepsis happen and blood uh, sepsis and things like this, or patient goes into shock because of rare or maybe uh, bacterial infection spread. So there are they, they can, the infection can spread maybe because of physical boundary. Uh, the infection can also spread uh, or the inflammation can spread. The inflammatory cells can spread through the lymphatics or the inflammatory cells can also spread through blood vessels. So this is what the data, and we have analyzed their data. And think of this data maybe as the second interviewer, an expert who was, who's expert in acute inflammation or inflammation, and this is what his interview has told us, and that is chapter two. And now we move on to chapter eight, maybe the eighth interviewer, or the eighth participant in our study, who is expert in uh, metastasis or in oncology or in cancer research. And he tells us that, Metastasis happens because of maybe the physical boundary, the cancer cells can spread because of the physical attachment. Uh, the cancer cells can also spread through lymphatics and the cancer cells can spread through the blood. So there can be meds to the bone or meds to the other brain or some other part of the body. And now we think, okay, fine. The second interviewer told us that this is how inflammation spreads. And now the eighth interviewer is telling us that this is how the cancer spreads. So when we look at it, maybe the spread mechanisms are the same, both in cancer as well as in inflammation or in sepsis. So this is to give you an idea about the axial coding, how you are going to compare and take a deeper meaning out of the data. So and this is something that we may not reach just by second or third reading. It may require slightly more readings. So this is just a visual picture of the previous slide. I see is initial code or integral code. So you can also call your initial codes. And then you can second cycle codes, as I said, axial codes are more focused on relationships. Relationships between uh, these codes or relationship between uh, these. Then you can have focus code. For example, if I'm asking my colleagues about their routine, and then I wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning, then I do my breakfast, I go, I have some exercise, then I go to the hospital, then I come back to home, then I go to my for my private practice, and then I come back for my private practice, and then I sit with my kids for half an hour. So I'll be just, and maybe three or four police have told me about this, and I'm just writing, making calls about their routine. And then I 
just maybe summarize or I can use an umbrella for such a self-regulation or self-control. That is telling me about these three, four different cores, maybe about the routine, about their uh, clinical duties, about their personal and professional life. And I just encompass it all under the code of self-regulation. And that can be my second cycle code. And then there can be an umbrella code, such as a theoretical code, that can then also become a theme. So just to, this is now the hierarchy. However, when you start doing the qualitative research, this is good to understand the theory of qualitative data analysis, how we do it. However, as I said, once you start doing it, it's quite an iterative process. So it will be difficult for you to uh, identify that now I have moved on from initial coding to uh, maybe the categories of first cycle coding, and now I have moved on to axial coding, or now I have, so it's just, I give you the example of pathology uh, when you were studying it. So we didn't realize how we were developing our depth, but we were reading it and reading it and reading it and we developing the depth about its understanding or any specialty that we uh, studied for. And then just to give you an idea, theme is something. And now some people even in some research, you would find categories as the higher uh, overarching umbrella thing and in others, but in medical education or in medicine, usually our understanding is that theme is something that is probably the upper one or the higher hierarchy and the categories are lower in the hierarchy. Okay, so now let's get back to that data. So what is a code? A code can be a single word, a code can be few words, a code can be a complete sentence just like this one. Or a code can be a complete paragraph or maybe a complete page or maybe up to three or four pages. Just in, as I said, in narrative analysis, you do not break the data. In narrative analysis, you take the whole story as a code. So that is slightly different. However, over here, we are fragmenting the data now. So what we are doing, we are, the code, as I said, what was the question? The question was, what did this rotation added to your uh, um, knowledge or clinical competence or professional development. So the answer, so what was my question? This was my question. And what are the answers? Independence, I gained confidence. There was hurried pace. There was learning to prioritize. Uh, patient management is different in this department as compared to other rotations. There was high number of patients. History and physical examination skills were improved. Again, gained confidence in patient interaction. And this is slightly different. Administrative side of medicine. So all these things are, all these codes are answered to my question. So now what you can do, you can develop your own identification um, manual, or you can develop your own diary, or maybe an MS Word document or an Excel sheet in which you can just use abbreviations. So these abbreviations, there is no standard way of these abbreviations. Whatever is feasible or comfortable for you. I used to develop these abbreviations initially in my PhD, uh, but now I also do not develop these abbreviations. I rather, because now with softwares, I do not have to. The software will quickly uh, manage things for me. So I'm not that much concerned about the abbreviations. Okay. So I'm also keeping an eye on time so that uh, we started somewhere around 6.20, uh, probably in Pakistan standard time, it is 6.20. So it's six years. So we left with maybe 25 more minutes. Okay. So thematic data analysis. This is now another way. So you can see the same data that we had over here, these were the codes and then we developed some sort of categories or themes or classification. This was the curriculum theme. This was the educational experience theme. And this is theme is more focused on outcomes, gain confidence. So this is the outcome we want to achieve. Administrative side of it, this is again an outcome. How to learn more, work more efficiently, how to prioritize in clinical visits and how to improve physical exams. So these are all outcomes that we expect from uh, a fine year student or a house officer. Okay, the same data is now categorized from or classified 
from a very different perspective. So now here you can see this very same data is classified depending on the uh, different domains of learning. So this is the cognitive domain. This is the skills domain. And this is the behavioral or attitude domain. So rotation attributes that are generic to the rotation, quick pace and independent working. About the cognition, clinic administration and outpatient. About the skills, history and physical examination and learning to prioritize. And student's attitude, increased confidence in patient interaction. So this is the same data set, but the same data set is now classified in a different perspective. So you can also make different uh, visual metaphors. You can develop figures. You can make diagrams or trees or maybe triangles. So it shows a lot of creativity in the qualitative research and how creative you can uh, be in your data analysis. Uh, just to, as we say, picture worth thousand words. So when you can present something pictorially, that makes it quite understandable. And we health professionals are mostly quite pictorial uh, uh, in our learning. So curriculum theme, experiences and outcomes. So you can also link it uh, maybe uh, in form of a figure or you can develop some other metaphor for it. Okay, so let's now uh, come towards the overall concept. This, this is real and we are moving towards the abstract form of understanding. As we remember the story of Thirsty Crow, necessity is mother of invention. That was the theme that we generated. So that was quite abstract from the real life story. So there are quotes from the real situations, from the interviews, from the focus groups. We can develop sub quotes, then we develop categories. We can also develop subcategories. So this is particular and we are moving from particular towards more general, towards concepts, themes, and then theories or essentials. So this is how we can develop a theory from quotes in qualitative research. Okay, so let's look into the analysis, how we are going to present our results, because at the end of the day, we have to write articles uh, from this data. So how we are going to write articles and the rest of the introduction is same, discussion is same as quantitative research. Uh, the methodology again is going to tell you about the methods, if that's quantitative research or qualitative research. So the difference comes in results, because over there, it's the numbers that are results. Over here, it's the numbers that are going to make the results. So let's look at the raw data. This is the raw data. The closer I get to retirement age, the faster I want it to happen. I'm not even 55 yet, and I would give anything to retire now. But there is a mortgage to pay off, and still a lot more to soak away in savings before I can even think of it. I keep playing the lottery, though, in hopes of winning those millions. No luck yet. So here you can see preliminary course, retirement age, financial obligations, dreams of early retirement, you can see this is quite descriptive in nature. But over here, you can see a deeper meaning coming out of it. The person is trying to go for lotteries and maybe trying to win millions because he's worried about his mortgage and other savings. And maybe he wants to retire, but he is also concerned about uh, the anxiety around retirement. So uh, this is slightly deeper meaning of this uh, transcript. And this is a results table from one of uh, our papers. So we had some research with struggling students uh, and its impact on their academics. It was something about mentoring program that we wanted to start for these students. So you can see, and one of the issues, because the journals, the biomedical journals, they are still not very familiar with qualitative research and they're still concerned about the word count and issues like especially uh, the national level journals, the international journals, they have understood uh, this phenomenon, such as biomedical, biomed central group, the Springer group, elsewhere group, uh, Willie Blackwell. So they do understand the nature of qualitative research now. But if you have national journals that are also quite good, so in Pakistan, you do have some uh, national level journals that are extremely good and have quite high impact factor. They still struggle to understand the nature of qualitative research because the data is worse. The data is 
uh, in form of paragraphs and the word count is going to increase. So one of the ways that we, although the international journals, they are quite open and they would say, yes, you can send us the transcripts and we will publish it in form of paragraphs. So there is some of my results in, they are in form of paragraphs, lengthy paragraphs. However, in Pakistan, I have to, again, contain the word count within 3,000 words. So for that, one of the methods is you can develop tables. So that will make your data, again, quite efficient. And you just focus on few of the quotations rather than more quotations. So this is something you can see themes, the sub themes, fight with friends, one sided love, financial crisis, time management, distractions, commitments. So this is these are the issues of struggling undergraduate students. And there are some. So the data is these quotations. And this is something that always some of my colleagues, they always miss in their results section in their thesis or in their papers. The data is these quotations. So you must present these quotations, at least one quotation. And this is just the code, male, year four, student, 13th number student. So you can just give any code, maybe F1 for faculty one, or P1 for participant one, or S1 for student one, or C1 for college one. So whatever coding you want to use, uh, it's just to have an identification, also to have the anonymity so that you do not mention their name, but also to told them that who is this participant. Okay, so now let's look into the measuring the depth. As I said, content analysis is a bit superficial. It will give you some data, but as I said, because it does not give you a deeper meaning of the data, so maybe it the data may mislead you sometimes. However, content analysis in some of the papers, let me also clarify that in some of the literature, some of the researchers, in some of the books, some people say that the uh, content analysis is just as thematic analysis. So they call thematic analysis as content analysis. This is more in the sociology or anthropology. In medicine, we have a common understanding that we call it thematic analysis, that more deeper meaning, whereas content analysis is more focused on the frequency. But I, as I said, that content analysis in some of the literature, you may also find that people also call thematic analysis as content analysis. But discourse analysis, as I said, it's extremely uh, challenging research. One of my colleagues, she is right now doing a discourse analysis in her master's uh, research. And it's extremely challenging. I, as I said, it's just doing thematic analysis three times. So that's the amount of time that discourse analysis uh, takes. Okay, so that's pretty much all. I'm sorry I was extremely quick um, in my presentation because of the timing issue. And probably I think uh, if we had two hours, so we would have been, uh, I mean, more comfortable. Uh, with this uh, project, but probably in case if we ever get time again, so or if you have more interest in understanding or if you want to do qualitative research in pharmacy or in pharmacology or in industry, because we are now doing it with quite a lot of pharma industry and with agriculture on iron supplements and about their taste and about their diet issues. So people do tell us about these issues in nutrition, whether the children are liking it or not, or women are liking the iron supplements or the tablets or not, or, or zinc uh, diet. So uh, there's a lot of potential of qualitative research in different specialties. So you can also think about it. And I think we also discussed that in our previous session, how you can use qualitative research in uh, other specialties. So that's pretty much all from my side. I think uh, let's first, I don't know, shall we have first a question 